Yes, we do have some breaking news to share. I'm Austin Westfall. I'll be on the desk with you for the next few hours as we cover largely the Israel-Hamas war. Take a look at this tweet from Fox News foreign correspondent Trey Yinks saying he is following reports of large explosions in Iran, Iraq, and Syria, working to confirm and gather more information now. I'm going to read a little bit from the Jerusalem Post, who is saying that an Israeli missile strike targeted a site in Iran early Friday morning, according to ABC News. The report came shortly after local sources reported explosions in Isfahan in central Iran, as well as in the Aswayida uh, governorate of southern Syria and in the Baghdad area and Babil governorate, uh, governorate uh, of Iraq early Friday morning. So we're, we're kind of getting details in fluidly right now. What we're hearing is that there are videos reportedly from Isfahan, which is in Iran, appearing to show Iranian air defenses activated in the skies over the area. The Iranian semi-official Fars news agency reported that an explosion was heard uh, east of Isfahan and near the Isfahan International Airport. Fars stressed that the cause of the explosion was unknown as of yet. But again, I will reiterate, an Israeli missile strike targeted a site in Iran early Friday morning, according to ABC News. The Jerusalem Post saying that the report came shortly after local sources reported explosions in central Iran as well as in Syria and in Iraq as well. This is a story that we're following closely. We're going to be following Trey Yinks' feed closely as well. As you can see, he's working to confirm and gather more information now. But for now, we do have the perfect person standing by to help us dissect some of what's going on. Dr. Alone Burstein. Um, Alone, l let's start here. So far, Iraq, Iran, Syria is where we're hearing these explosions are taking place. We, as of yet, do not have any independent confirmation that Israel is responsible for these attacks. What surface level information are we finding so far tonight? So good to see you. Um, and, you know, like you said, this is happening as we speak. It is currently 5 a.m. in Israel, um, you know, which is typical for when, like, you know, sort of cross border attacks would happen. Um, but Everything I'm saying, obviously, is very, very surface level. Um, right now, the fact that the attack occurred, the only attack that's being reported thus far in Iran, the fact that it occurred in Isfahan is not surprising. Isfahan is very strategic, it's also very symbolic. It is an area where there have been a lot of, Ira of Iranian nuclear f facilities and sites since 2004. Um, I cannot say that these strikes occurred specifically targeting the nuclear sites in Isfahan, but it's, it's a very symbolic place for Israel to carry out that attack on the one hand. On the other hand, it's also very symbolic and important as far as Israel is concerned and its relationship with the United States right now, that it is possible that this is a retaliation that's being carried out throughout the entire region instead of only on Iran, right? Iran carried out its attack targeted through all of its weight and certainly not everything that it could. But everything that it chose to throw in the attack, it threw at Israel directly. It didn't throw at Israeli interests or U.S. interests throughout the Middle East. In turn, the United States has applied a lot of pressure on Israel, saying, do not escalate this further. Do not now throw a massive retaliation at Iran. If Israel carries out now a very big retaliation on the one hand, on the other hand, not all targeted at Iran itself, one symbolic attack at Iran, and then attacks at different strategic targets that Iran may have, in Iraq, in Syria. We may even see attacks that occur in Yemen. That is the way for Israel, in turn, to say, on the one hand, it can satisfy its internal coalition and say, yes, we attacked Iran, and specifically Isfahan, a very strategic place. On the other hand, not, you know, forgive me, piss off the United States by now escalating the situation further and actually carrying out the bulk of the retaliation elsewhere. So again, that's all speculation. Obviously, this is happening in the last half an hour. But that's what I'm reading in the fact that, like, the first reports of attack were not all in Iran. In fact, the majority of them so far are not in Iran. They're in Iraq and in Syria. I'm curious about Isfahan because we're, we're seeing, in a lot of the initial reports that are coming through right now, we're seeing that Isfahan is trending uh, on social media. We're seeing, uh, what is the significance of that particular location? So just in the past, there have been a lot of different um, political unrest in that area. But more importantly than that, it's a strategic location because Iran started its nuclear program in the early 21st century. 
I mean, there's a lot of rumors that it tried to start it before, but in the early 21st century is really when it started to develop its nuclear program. And already in 2004, um, there, were a, there was a lot of reports of different nuclear research that was being done in, I'm sorry, I'm, just, I'm trying to read the news as it's coming in now, that's so why I'm sort of half, look, half looking down as I see uh, tweets come in, um, in nuclear facilities that may have been positioned in Isfahan itself. That's not to say that that's their main nuclear research site. I don't know where their main nuclear facilities are. Um, I presume that, you know, both Israel and the United States do know. But historically, Isfahan has been one of the places, alongside Tehran, that Iran has tried to very, very strategically protect. It has deployed a lot of anti-air batteries there. So there obviously is something strategic in that city. Whether the IDF, Israel, admits or doesn't admit, and whether they actually do hit those strategic sites or do not, the fact that they hit specifically the strategic cities is would be as significant as an attack hitting a strategic site. Let's say if uh, missiles hit Israel, right? There's a difference if you hit the northern part of Israel or if you hit Jerusalem or Tel Aviv. Or if an attack would come to the United States, it would just come off differently if it hit even, you know, obviously an important place, some Seattle or, or, or California, or if it hit D.C. or New York. There are places that are like important to the, the culture and important to the country in saying that this is a site that we will never be hit. That's why 9-11, right? The Pentagon, the, the New York. Like, there are sites that are very important. Isfahan is just one of these places that is seen as very protected and very important due to its involvement in nuclear research already for over 20 years. So carrying out a strike there is sending a message. It's sending a message to Iran. But more than that, it's also sending a message to the Israeli public saying, see, Israel retaliated to something important with, maybe without needing to actually escalate towards a full-on regional war. What have been some of the narratives surrounding international pressure toward Israel? Obviously, there has been a lot of speculation out there about Israel responding to Iran's attack over the weekend. I believe um, there have been many reports to say that Israel will respond in some way. I've also seen reporting to say that they're still weighing how to respond Catch us up uh, over this past week. What has Israel said about whether or not they will respond in some way to Saturday's Iranian attack? Israel has repeatedly said that they're going to respond. There's been no report that Israel said that it's not going to respond. The Prime Minister has said that. The Minister of Defense has said that. Minister Gantz has said that. The Chief of Staff has said that. They've all said they're going to respond. There are some surprising political parties that go have to do with Israel's internal politics, the older Orthodox parties, that have actually called on Israel not to respond for other reasons. But the majority of everyone in Israel's establishment and security establishment and leading the government have said that they're going to respond. At the same time, there's monumental international pressure from the United States to the EU, to different allies of Israel, to non-allies of Israel, to Russia, that have all called on Israel to say, do not escalate the situation further. Also regional partners, Jordan, very scared that the skies of Jordan are going to turn out to be the area where Iran and Israel clash. So there's been a lot of pressure back and forth. One of the, th one of the reasons to suspect that Israel may try to not escalate the situation very much further, that's why, again, at least as of now, when we're about 45 minutes into Israel's retaliation, I am saying maybe we'll see more of an emphasis on the region and less on direct attacks on Iran is because there's been a couple of reports about the ongoing um, negotiations between Israel and the United States that really would suggest that Israel is not going to carry out a major attack on Iran. One is the fact that the United States today vetoed the UN Security Council resolution to accept Palestine as a full member state of the UN. It would be very surprising to me if Israel would, on that day that the US pretty much did Israel a huge favor in the UN, Israel were to carry out an attack in Iran that the U.S. didn't sign off on. Israel would just slap Iran in the uh, sorry, would just slap the U.S. in the face. So likely, the United States knew about what Israel's response is going to be, and therefore, it's probably not going to be that escalatory. One, two. There's also been reports in the last several days, and specifically in the last two days, that part of the negotiations between Israel and the United States in the last two days have been that the United States is going to approve an Israeli operation in Rafah, right? the Israeli invasion of the most southern town of Rafah, who we've been talking about for, what, a month and a half already, is going to sign off on that in exchange for Israel not carrying out a major retaliation in Iran. That's going to be the back and forth. Today, there was a meeting 
between the head of the National Security Council in Israel and the U.S. National Security Advisor. And at that meeting, the United States even took a different tone. It said, yes, we share the desire to destroy Hamas and Rafah. Whereas before they were saying, we disagree that Israel needs to invade Rafah. So seemingly, there's some agreement between Israel and the United States with regards to invading Rafah. And if that means that Israel has agreed to not carry out a big retaliation against Iran, what we may see is, again, something more minimal, like a, a nominal attack on Iran itself, and then a much larger retaliation or meaningful retaliation against the regional interests of Iran in Syria or in Iraq. Again, I think maybe we'll see something in Yemen. Remains to be seen. And we obviously wait here to, to see if there is any confirmation in the immediate time as to whether or not this is actually an Israeli attack. I'm going to pull up some live images we have because I know we're both checking our feeds right now, our news wires. We're, we're both looking for information in real time here. This is a live image out of Tel Aviv. We are watching. We were watching these images live as we were watching those uh, yeah. Iranian strikes uh, make their way. It was an hours long affair as we sat here, uh, U.S. time, Saturday afternoon. This is a live image out of southern Gaza. This is a camera planted in southern Israel looking at the Gaza skyline. Um, I do know that what we do look at, and a lot of times what we rely on with these feeds, is seeing any type of military activity taking place in these areas. But now we're talking about a completely different area uh, alone. We're talking about Iran, and then we can't forget, we're also hearing reports of explosions in Iraq and Syria. What could be the tie-in to Iraq and Syria specifically here? So Iraq is particularly interesting in this context because let's not forget that the entire escalation right now is a result of the attack that occurred in Syria against the Iranian consulate in Damascus. The IDF has been carrying out skirmishes with different militias in Syria since the war began and also prior to the war and going back to the Syrian civil war. There have been different escalations and rounds between the IDF and militias in Syria and even the Syrian army. The IDF though has rarely carried out attacks in Iraq. Iraq is much farther, it's a different state. There was even some notion, uh, very, very fleeting, for a while with you know, new Iraqi government here and there that there might even be relations between Israel and Iraq. Israel has not carried out a lot of attacks in Iraq. And specifically, it's being reported that there are attacks that are occurring in Baghdad. And again, all this is speculation. All we know is that explosions were heard in Baghdad. It is technically possible that that's a coincidence. I doubt it, but it is technically possible that we're not going to hear that Israel's all of a sudden attack sites in Baghdad, but instead that other things are happening in that region. But attacking the entire region, Iran, Iraq, Syria, and there's also ongoing, as there are every night, attacks in Lebanon. Is Israel also trying to send a message back? And Iran tried to send a message with its attack. It did not throw all of its weight into attacking Israel. It threw a good amount of weight, 350 drones, ballistic missiles, and cruise missiles, trying to send a message, attacking the entire region, and specifically, maybe, Iranian targets in the heart of Baghdad, or in Syria at the same moment as overcoming the different Iranian air defenses and carrying an attack in Isfahan, is Israel sending a message back? Is Israel saying, you know, don't play with us. You want to carry out that attack? We have the ability to strike back not only in Iran, if we want to, we can, but not only in Iran, all of your interests, Iraq, Syria. Again, I would be surprised if Israel does not carry out some attack in Yemen also, although that also would have to be negotiated with the United States, but Israel has yet to retaliate to the Houthi attacks and it's been waiting for an opportunity. So it's possible that we'll hear about that also tonight. So again, that would be sort of this middle ground on the one hand saying, look, we struck back. On the other hand, but we did not now escalate it to a full-on war, right? Similarly to the way that Israel came under pressure from the world and also some internal pressure saying, you don't need to retaliate to Iran. They didn't actually cause that much damage. Similarly, right, if this is it, it may not be, but if this is it for Israel's retaliation, then Iran may come under the same pressure internally, or maybe from Russia, or from other countries saying, look, you don't need to retaliate to this now. This is not an escalatory move that you have no choice but to retaliate to. So again, that remains to be seen, but that's what I read into this regional attack and why Israel might be carrying 
that out and more placing more emphasis on the region like Iraq rather than Iran. I want to ask, we, we've been covering this uh, Iran-Israel situation all week, ever since Saturday, of course. Um, wh when we talk about how Israel has said that they would retaliate for Saturday's attack, what has Iran said in response to that claim? Because Iran has also said that they would retaliate to Israel's retaliation, correct? Absolutely. Iran has tried to make clear that what they wanted to achieve in their attack is a, di a new phase of strategy. Up until now, Iran has had this ongoing sort of proxy war with Israel in which Israel carries out, you know, its ongoing skirmishes with different terror organizations in the region. And Iran funds them and Iran helps them. And on occasion, Israel would retaliate against also even Iranian Revolutionary Guards. But that had nothing to do with direct Israel-Iran. Iran was upping the ante and saying, no, the rules of the game have changed. Now you struck us in Syria, we're striking you directly. The big fear in Israel was that if Israel does not retaliate against this right now, what's going to happen the next time Israel wants to carry out an attack in Syria for its own strategic, tactical interests? Is this going to be now a new equation that every time Israel carries out an attack against an Iranian target or even non-Iranian target, let's say a Hezbollah target, in Syria or in Lebanon. All of a sudden, now Iran will say, well, we've made clear, we send missile when you carry out attacks in this region. So, is, so Iran wanted to set a new rules of the game, and Israel in turn wanted to say, well, if that's the case, then you're going to be fired back upon. Iran, in answer to your question, has over the week said, no, you don't understand. We've set the new rules of the game. We retaliated against you and we're done. If we are attacked, as far as we're concerned, we see that now as your escalation. The rules of the game are you attacked us in Syria, we attack you. End of story. That's what Iran is saying. End of story. Now, if you carry out another attack, as far as we're concerned, you're starting a new wave and we are going to retaliate against you. Iran also said something interesting. I'm not sure what to make of it. It also implied that it has something up its sleeve in the sense that it said if an attack is carried out on its own soil, then Iran is going to introduce a new weapon into the region, into the war. Now, as far as the world knows, Iran does not have nuclear weapons. And it is possible that that is just an attempt to threaten. It is possible it's an empty threat. It's possible that what Iran meant is if that's the case, if they are attacked, then they are going to in develop new weapons. But that remains to be seen, what that actually means. What is going to be Iran's response? And more importantly, are they going to respond themselves? Or is this going to be now a response that they carry out through their proxies? That's really going to tell us where things are going to develop. Is Iran going to now say, okay, now we're attacked, now we're at war? Unlikely. Iran may do the same type of attack and retaliation, but it's unlikely if this is all that we see. But what we may see is Iran saying, okay, we're letting Hezbollah loose now. You've done that, now Hezbollah go and fire 100,000 missiles on Israel. Again, unlikely, but they could also just activate. They have a lot more militias and proxies that they could activate in the region. I, I should make a correction for our viewers because we had a skyline shot up earlier that we said was Tel Aviv. It was not earlier. Now it is Tel Aviv. So, alone, uh, I'll ask you a similar question I asked you over the weekend when the Iranian attack was taking place. Let's tie this all together for our viewers because they might hear Israel and Iran and they might question, well, what does this have to do with the Israel-Hamas war? It has quite a bit to do with the Israel-Hamas war. Can you fill in, can you, can you connect the two for us, please? I'm connecting the two. I'm just going to say that I just saw also a news flash saying that Iran has closed its airspace in Isfahan, Shiraz, and Tehran. So, and, and their I mean, international is, airport was, was possibly one of the places where yeah. some of this activity was taking place. So at least as far as Iran's response is concerned, it appears to be expecting attacks also in those other cities, not just in Isfahan. Um, in terms of the connection to the Israel-Hamas war, Iran has a long history of supporting the what's called the resistance access to Israel and to normalization with Israel and to any Israeli-Palestinian peace. Let's just say it that way. This goes back to officially it started in, I mean, it started in the Iranian Revolution, but like the time that Iran started to openly back Palestinian groups was 1991. 
1991, Iran forms an alliance with Hamas, open alliance. Iran starts to fund Hamas with a mil- at, the, at the time, a, a lot of money for Hamas was a very young organization at that time, a million dollars. They start to fund the organization because they wanted to challenge the idea that Israel was going to possibly make peace with the PLO. Right, for our viewers, you may remember the famous handshake between Rabin and Arafat on the White House lawn in 1993. That was Israel and the Palestinian Liberation Organization, the PLO, possibly agreeing to make peace. Hamas was one of the Palestinian organizations that was very opposed to that. They were very opposed to that. They see the idea of peace with Israel as you know, heresy. They're fighting a, a jihadist war. Iran has over the years taken upon itself to fund and ally and arm all of these organizations that are part of the resistance access, so that includes Hamas, the Palestinian Islamic Jihad, Hezbollah, Amal, a, a slew of other organizations that their one common denominator is that they object to the idea that there could be peace between Israel and the Palestinians. So Iran is extremely involved in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict on the side of Hamas. Then, in addition to that, you have Iranian regional interests. Iran has an interest in more and more countries where there is a Shiite population, that is one of the main denominations in Islam, where there is a Shiite population, and that population causing insurrections and creating either governments that are in support of Iran or possibly even theocracies so they can be puppet states of Iran. That is what Iran has tried desperately to create in Iraq. That is what Iran has, to some extent, created in Syria. The Assad regime, after Iran saved its life during the Syrian civil war, is completely beholden to it. That is why Iran funds the Houthis in Yemen, also Shiites. Why Iran funds Hezbollah in Lebanon, also Shiites. It's all part of this regional aspiration of Iran to make sure that Shiites in different countries are not just living peacefully, but instead are carrying out insurrections are being armed to the teeth, are being funded, are being radicalized in order to possibly have revolutions like we've seen in Yemen, possibly have revolutions in order to become local allies of Iran. So between those two things, between Iran funding the quote-unquote resistance access of the Palestinians and also carrying out all of the or funding and supporting and arming all of these militias in the region, Iran and Israel are two trades that are always heading towards collision. Up until this week, that collision has always been for proxies. It's always been Israel versus Hezbollah, which is an Iranian affiliate. Israel versus Hamas, which is funded by Iran. And things like that. This weekend and this week is the first time that we're seeing the ongoing collision between Israel and Iran. A lot depends on Iran right now. Will Iran say, okay, and now we're we're gonna have a full-on war between the sides? I doubt it. Thus far, it seems that Iran would much rather have its proxies do the dirty work and then suffer Israel's retaliation. But obviously that depends on the extent that Israel is going to carry out this attack right now. Like we said, we're now an hour in. So alone, I'm gonna keep you on here with us for a moment here while I read a little bit of what the Associated Press is reporting about the situation for now. They report that commercial flights began diverting their routes over Western Iran without explanation early Friday as one semi-official news agency in the Islamic Republic reported, quote, explosions heard over the city of Isfahan. State television acknowledged, quote, loud noise. The incident comes as tension remains high in the wider Middle East after Iran's unprecedented missile and drone attack on Israel. Dubai-based carriers, Emirates and Fly Dubai, began diverting around Western Iran about 4.30 a.m. local time. They also offered no explanation, though local warnings to aviators suggested that the airspace may have been closed. Iranian state television began a scrolling on-screen alert acknowledging a, quote, loud noise near Esfahan without immediately elaborating. The Israeli military has not immediately responded to a request for comment, according to the Associated Press. So all that is to say alone that there's a whole lot of information out there, but not a whole lot of confirmation out there yet. So that's something, and I'm, I'm hearing from my producer, can you say that one more time? So we're getting some information uh, from AP and and a little bit of what we were just discussing, flights being diverted around Western Iran as one report claims explosions heard near Isfahan. So I'll ask you something that might might be on everybody's mind right now as we wait for any sort of official confirmation that this may be an Israeli strike. You follow this stuff very closely. You follow this stuff day in and day out. You follow the leaks in the area. Um, 
how often is it for three explosions to take place in three separate states all around the same time, especially in the manner that we're talking about right now? It, it does seem like something intentional is taking place here. This would be quite uh, amazing if it wasn't something intentional going on here, correct? Absolutely correct. Um, look, it is in all 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 likelihood in Israeli retaliation. We also had, like, uh, I think, ABC or NBC um, reported, like, quoted American sources that said that there are, yes, confirmation that Israeli missiles are landing in the region. That said, and this would also not be the first time that, that something like that would happen. Um, in 2021, Israel carried out a, a, a simultaneous assassination of Palestinian Islamic Jihad operatives in Gaza and of their not senior leadership, but sort of one level below senior leadership in Damascus at the same hour. Like, Israel has a history of doing things like this. The two big questions, or several big questions. One, is this an open Israeli attack or not? Israel, I remind everyone, did not actually claim responsibility for the attack in Syria in the consulate in Damascus. It did not claim responsibility for that for reasons that it would actually be violating international law to attack a consulate. And we're not getting, I'm not getting into the ethics or the specifics, I'm just saying factually, Israel chose to not take responsibility for that. Everyone knew it was Israel and Iran retaliated. It remains to be seen if Israel takes responsibility for this and is open about that, because that'll be a game changer. If Israel does not take responsibility for it, that also will be easier for Iran to say, and, and we're done, and we're done. Whereas if Israel goes out and boasts about this and says, look at our big retaliation in Isfahan, the big city of the Iranian Revolutionary Guards, then it will be harder for Iran to ignore it. So that's one question. Another question is, what specifically was targeted? Again, all of these places, Isfahan, possibly Shiraz at Tehran, um, Baghdad, Syria, uh, the Azur area, I think was, is what El Miyadin was reported was attacked. All these areas have a lot of strategic targets for Iran. What was attacked? That makes a big difference. What was attacked? Was it the airport? Was it an Iranian nuclear facility? Was it a facility of the Iranian Revolutionary Guards? Are we even going to know? Is it possible that Iran is not going to report and Israel is not going to say? All these things matter. What matters most is, again, what is reported, what people know, because that's going to determine if there's a lot of public sentiment in Iran saying, we've just had a national humiliation so you must retaliate, that's going to make Iran retaliate. Whereas if Israel does not boast about it, and Iran in turn does not say what happened, it could end there. All these things are going to be what determines the outcome. And the same goes for when you ask like, you know, simultaneous explosions in Iraq, Syria, Iran. Same thing. What was attacked in Baghdad? Right? It could be that it is the head of the Islamic resistance in Iraq. That is a coalition of militias that are loyal to Iran, that are very, very powerful. It would be a huge win for Israel. I'm, I'm making this up. There's no reason for me to think that that's what was attacked. I'm just saying, let's say that that's what was attacked. It would be a huge win for Israel if that's what was attacked. But that's also something that Iran can say, okay, but that happened in Iraq. Yes, they're militia loyal to us, but that's nothing to do with us. In turn, if Israel or other forces in Iraq, let's say, start to say, look at the monumental blow that Israel dealt to Iran, Iran is so humiliated, we're going to see an Iranian response. That's just how, how, how this works. Like, unfortunately, it's almost the game of saving face. So what matters is, is Israel going to take responsibility? What specifically was targeted? And then can Iran, you know, sort of afford to not to, to, to not retaliate in the sense of not losing a lot of um, pride with its local population. All those are the questions that are going to determine where things go right now. And again, I'll say more importantly for the context of the Israel-Hamas war, they're going to determine if militias are now activated, if Hezbollah now is like, okay, it's time for you to throw your weight into the war, or the Houthis, or if it's going to just go back to being the same you know, low-level fighting that we've seen. Has Israel flexed their military muscle in a way like this? Uh, if this is, in fact, an Israeli attack, um, have we seen, and this is what we're talking about, something that's inside of Iran proper, is this something we've seen before? No. Um, again, not openly. Israel has, in the past, carried out a lot of clandestine operations in Iran, and some of them it has been open about after the fact. Prime Minister Netanyahu held a big press conference 
demonstrating and showing, I believe this was in 2017, uh, demonstrating and showing thousands upon thousands of files and computer disks that the Mossad had managed to steal from Iranian nuclear facilities. So that was a clandestine operation that then went public. There's also been a hell of a lot of, let's just say random explosions, random assassinations of chief scientists of Iran's nuclear program that is pretty clear has always been Israel, but Israel, so, but, but Israel never took responsibility for those. So there's been a lot of clandestine operations. Some of it later becomes open, some of it not. But we've never seen, like, Israel's never openly attacked Iran in this way. It has carried out attacks in the past in the region. In 1981, Israel carried out a major bombing of uh, nuclear facilities in Iraq when Iraq was trying to develop its nuclear program. In 2007, Syria was trying to develop a nuclear program, and Israel bombed that. So it has done these types of things in the region in the past to stop regional threats. Iran is a bit different. Iran is much bigger. Iran is much stronger than both of those countries. Iran has all these militias. And Iran, when they were building their nuclear program and when they were building up their army, they knew that they would be the target of Israel. So unlike Iraq or Syria, they've spread out their nuclear facilities. They've buried them deep into mountains. So we haven't seen anything of this scale, certainly in Iran. We have seen Israel operate regionally. But again, we actually don't know what the scale of what we're talking about right now. All we know is that there were some explosions in Isfahan and we'll you know, be smarter as the hours go on. So the time is just past 5.30 in the morning uh, in Tel Aviv right now. Uh, I, I want to ask, um, when we talk about this, uh, and again, let's, let's assume this is some sort of Israeli retaliation, uh, what does that mean for international relations as a whole? I, I guess what I'm trying to ask here is, uh, what has the U.S. said to Israel as far as giving it some sort of guidance as to how a retaliatory effort should be carried out. So the United States has been trying very much to get Israel to not carry out a retaliation that will escalate the region. The United States has not forbid Israel from retaliating. And I say that, and I, and I choose my words carefully, because the United States has forbid Israel from doing things in the past. And much as Israel boasts about saying it doesn't care what the U.S. says, it does. It does care very much about what the U.S. says. The U.S. told it not to invade Rafah, and Israel has not invaded Rafah yet. So it does seem like the United States can forbid Israel, and they did not forbid Israel from retaliating. I think because the U.S. also agrees that the United States, sorry, the United States also agrees that Israel needs to retaliate in order to not allow this new equation uh, take hold this new equation that Iran can attack whatever it wants, and Israel just just takes it. So, the, the you, sorry, I'm checking my phone about um, oncoming news and trying to trying to catch up. So, the United States has actually tried to make Israel to not um, to not escalate the situation. On the one hand, on the other hand, it has let it retaliate. One of the things that are important to note is that Israel openly said that it is not going to retaliate without informing the United States first. And that also tells us something about what, what's likely to be the scale of the retaliation, and it's not likely to be something that sends the entire region up in flames. It's not likely to be something that all of a sudden we're going to see Qatar being attacked, uh, or Saudi Arabia being attacked by Iran, like the entire region, like all the regional allies all of a sudden blowing up. Very unlikely. Again, it's important to remember the context. Earlier today, the U.S. vetoed the Palestinian request to become a member state in the U.N. We are hearing reports that the United States is gradually agreeing to an Israeli invasion of Rafah. This means that right now, the United States is doing things in Israel's favor. It is highly unlikely that Israel would in turn go off and carry out a retaliation that the U.S. did not sign off on. And since the U.S. has openly said that it does not want a retaliation that will escalate the region, we're likely to see a retaliation that at least has the potential to not escalate the region, has the potential to stay within the bounds of now Israel retaliated, and theoretically, Israel can say, and we're done, and then we'll see what's going to be Iran's response. All right, alone, we will leave it there for now. Take care. We will uh, be talking to you in the next hour as well, but for now, we will leave it there. Take care.